Okay, so we're still in ancient church history. We're going to be there for a while. I'll tell you, all day long today, I was preparing for one thing, and then I realized when I got here, we're not there yet. Um, well, all, all day long, I've had it in my head. We were on the Nicene Creed. We're not on the Nicene Creed. We're on the Apostles' Creed. We haven't gotten in the Council of Nicaea yet. Um, but uh, that's okay. We will get there. Um, today, we're talking about a time period between 100 and 313. When the church is forced to, because of all the persecution that's going on, because of all the heresies that are going on, because of all the arguments and the schisms that are going on as the church grows and people come in and they start to argue about well, all these things we've been talking about in church history, um, you know, internal problems and external with the Roman state, they have to seek to close ranks. Kind of, what does it mean to be Christian, Christians? What does it mean? We can't just be a loose. We have to close up and sure up what we are. And this is going to lead to things like the development of what we know as the New Testament during this time period. Because, it, remember, up until this period, what, what we've been talking about Everything we've been talking about for all these weeks, I think we're 12 weeks in, something like that, 11, 12 weeks into this study, we have not had a New Testament yet. I mean, yes, books have been written, but there's no the New Testament. There's no ca uh, canon yet, no official canon. Um, we're also going to see things like the monar monarchical bishops, and uh, we're going to be talking about, and, and we're going to see some creeds start to pop up. Um, this is also when we're talking, we're going to talk about, you know, around the year 170, the church started calling itself Catholic. Now that's with a little c, Catholic. Anyone know what the word Catholic means? Nope. Catholic. It's a word that means universal. So they are the universal, the Catholic Church is the universal church. Um, and that's, um, it is first used by Ignatius in his epistle to Smyrna. And um, so, but it's it's not like the Catholic Church has existed yet. It's just they, the church itself has started referring to itself as Catholic, as universal, as all people are uh, are are called to worship Jesus. And so it's not a official gathering yet. Um, though church history, I know a lot of people, a lot of you have have issues with the Catholic Church. Uh, because of some of their teachings and because of things that have happened in the past to you or you might have been raised up in a bad Catholic church. Or, um, uh, and they're a good Catholic church too. But, uh, um, you know, just like all churches, there are good ones and bad ones. And, um, and so a lot of you have problems, but a lot of church history will be wrapped around the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church. And actually, one of the things we're talking about today is the development of the monarch, the monarchical, monarchical bishops. Uh, when I say that word, what's that mean? What's monarch mean? Yeah, ruler, sovereign ruler. And so what we see is through practice and kind of a theoretical necessity it's going to develop into the idea that there is one bishop or one set of bishops that are higher than the rest this apostolic succession is what they call it apostolic succession the apostles hand it down and um And um, and we because you know we, they need a leader in times of problems and persecution and with the heresies they need someone or some ones 
to kind of be like, okay, settle the issue. What about this? What about that? And in the Old Testament, we see things like Moses rising up, and we see, uh, you know, the, the, the apostolic king, the kings, you know, that, that, that the line of David. And so we will see, because of these kind of traditions, and just out of necessity with all the persecution going on, that, well, it starts out with three major, we started talking about two major schools last week, and the third one, we'll, we'll raise up these bishops, these major bishops, these major school bishops, that kind of looked at as the head. There's the Roman Catholic, the Roman Church, the Church in Rome. There's the one in Alexandria, and the one in Carthage. These three, and then there's also one in Jerusalem, but he falls off. That that bishop falls off relatively quickly because of persecution in and. Um, but you you have these these bishops that are like leaders of the the Christian movement. And eventually it will develop that as they um, as they as they go that they will they will seek to say, well, who has the final say, I guess we should say, on certain issues. And over time Rome becomes the head church. Now um, Rome has some things going for it that kind of leads to it becoming the lay church. It's the church that was, according to history, uh, started by Peter, who, according to uh, one re- way of reading the Bible, you will, Peter, I will build my church on, on you. Um, that is not the only way to translate that verse, by the way. But uh, we're not here to argue that one. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but so you have this, like, okay, so according to that tradition, that um, Peter, you, and he started this church. And then on top of that, um, in Matthew 16, 19, Christ gave Peter the keys to the kingdom. And he's commissioned to John in John 21 to feed his sheep. And so we have this idea that, that Peter started this church, so he has kind of a, and he starts Rome, the Roman church, according to tradition. So he, it has this kind of prestige to it because Peter, the lead disciple, the one that Jesus gave the rule to, will start. And so, um, and, and on top of that, um, let's see, did I write these things down for you guys? Um, I did not. So you guys have to just listen to me. Um, Both Peter and Paul were martyred in Rome for their faith and were part of the Roman church at the end there. So that puts Rome on a higher level, the Roman church there at a higher level. Uh, Rome itself is the center of the world. It'll be like the church in Washington, D.C., you know, or the the church in London, you know, it automatically has this prestige because it is the capital of the empire. Um, it's been the center of the earliest persecution, so it's stood up under the persecution the longest, which gives it some prestige, uh, right or wrong. Um, the longest letter in your Bible from Paul is to the church in Rome. That's why it follows Acts, Acts Romans, because it's the longest one, even though it was probably one of the last ones written. Um, It was one of the longest. Um, It's one of the largest and wealthiest of the Christian churches by AD 100 because it's in the capital. And Roman soldiers and wealthy people are starting to convert to Christianity. And so it becomes one of the wealthiest churches. And we know that this leads to power. You know, right or wrong, we know it happens. Um, So after all of this, and then... um, And then also because of works by Clement, Ignatius, Irenaeus, and Cyprian, who we've talked about in the past... 
all these names, these church historians that are writing letters to everybody, very famous, they all support the uh, the apostolic line from Peter in the Roman bishops. So it leads to um, them being one of the highest churches. Um, So after 135, Jerusalem is is destroyed, so the bishop of Jerusalem ceases to become the, he was the main rival of the Roman church because it was Jerusalem. You know, that's where Christianity started, right? 135, that gets destroyed. So no more bishop there to rival him. Um, Alexandria um, and Antioch face wars and invasion, so they get lower on the totem pole. Um, Ephesus loses prestige as uh, Montanism, that religion we talked about, that fault, her, her, the Montanism. Remember we talked about her, Montanism? That floods through that area, so that loses its prestige. So we see all these things start to like happen that puts Rome on top. And so we have what's developed as, so over time, and this doesn't happen overnight, over time, we have the Roman church, the last one standing with the most prestige and the most money. So it becomes the boss. Um, well, yes, the believers, and they knew that the believers were the church as well. But they're talking about who is the head bishop, who's the head leader, who's the head pastor. What kind of hierarchy? Remember, they haven't established, like right now, each church, like, okay, each denomination is actually different. Uh, Some of you guys come from denominations where you have a hierarchy. Um, For, say, like the um, Assemblies of God has a hierarchy. There's people, there's the pastor, and there's people over him, there's people over them, until you get to the top. Uh, Methodist is like that. Uh, Catholic, obviously, we've been talking about the Catholic Church, but we all know he's the Pope's the head. Um, Lutheran has something similar to that, yes. Not exactly. They are more independent, but they do have a head head leadership. Um, I come from a different, I come from a Baptist background, um, they're where every church is pretty much independent. Uh, they do whatever they want, and therefore you have some Baptist churches that are really good, and you have others that are not because there's no one keeping ties on them. Uh, <laughs> so, I'm not arguing theology with you. I'm telling you this is what happens. <laughs> this is history. <laughs> We're not here to argue the theology of whether it happened was right or wrong. This is what happens. Um, you know, obviously, I come from a Baptist background, so we obviously don't believe in. So we believe in the the the, the priesthood of the, of the the believers, and we don't have uh, anyone over top of us. Um, so obviously, I agree with you, but um, but other people in this room may not because they come from a different you know that's. Um, a different group, of, a way of organizing the church. But in, in history, this is what happens. They start, they have problems, persecution, in, outside problems, inside problems, you know, hierarchy. And so they look to someone, well, how do we solve these issues? They don't even have a New Testament, like the New Testament they can turn to and say, well, what does the, you know, we always say, what does the Bible say about that, right? They don't have that yet. You remember, Jim, the Old Testament has, was, was solidified in AD 70 by the Jews. So that's not even, that's just becoming in, in, uh, in, you know, so they don't have what we, you know, they don't have the, the blessing we do. No, they have some. I mean, and we're going to talk about that as we get to the development of the New Testament, but um, at which we, I hope to get to today, uh, but may not. Um, but they had, you know, so the, there are different lists. And, you know, but this church over here may have these books. 
And these two church over here may have these books. Remember, they're not books like we know them. Printing press won't be delivered until much, 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 thousands of years later. So it's all handwritten, scrolls or in folios, what will become a book. Their, their folios are starting to develop at this point. Um, wax paper is also popular for writing in areas that um, uh, paper is, uh, the papyrus or, or, or reed are very expensive, so they will use wax, and then, of course, that gets damaged really easily. Um, so you, you're going to have, so, you, you know, you're going to have fragments. What we have, you know, we are so blessed by saying, being able to say, what does the Bible say about this subject? And then we get to dive in. Oh, my goodness, how much of a blessing is that, that this early church does not have? All that's being developed. And so these why some of these people, even though, I disagree with some of the theology. They're my heroes of the faith because they are in this and they are developing. What does it mean? I mean, the apostolic uh, uh, creed that we're going to talk about next, um, it's all about who is God? Who is this God we worship? And I mean, this sounds like so basic to us because we, you know, we have the Bible. But they're asking this question because it's not universally established yet. This is, no, the, the New Testament church has started. Uh, you've missed a lot, I know. Uh, we are in about the year one, see, the New Testament church was, was, was about 5 to uh, 33 was when Jesus died, roughly. You know, we say 33, that's like pastor shorthand to say it was about that time period. <laughs> um, they did start in homes. They started in synagogues. They started in homes. They started in schools and auditoriums and um, anywhere they could meet. Uh, wealthy people's homes. And, and so this church is developing um, the, 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 what they believe. Uh, and 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 one of the things they start to do is they start to develop this. Uh, Rome starts to become the leader, and they start to develop rules of faith, which we call creeds. Um, if you had to define the word creed, what what would you? Mission, kind of like a mission statement. Yeah, sure, that, that makes sense. It's a statement of faith for public use. It contains articles needful for salvation and theological well-being of the church. Now, creeds in some traditions of the church are very important. Even some of them, you have to sign them and agree with them before you can even become part of the denomination. Um... Uh, this church here, we are non-creedal. We didn't ask you, like, hey, do you believe this before you join the church? You know, we've got people in here from all kinds of denominations. <laughs> um, we're non-creedal. Which means we don't hold to any one creed, direct creed, one statement of faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we have people from everyone. We don't make you be Baptist before you join. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so we've got people from everyone here. Uh, and uh, some denominations are very picky about this. Like, the, you know, you have to know the Apostles' Creed. You have to know the Nicene Creed. You have to know the... Um, anyways, you have to know all these creeds before you even can even join the church. Um, catechism is part of catechism. It's not all of catechism, but part of catechism is learning the creeds. Um, and so it's very important for some traditions, not for others. But even if you don't, like, like I'm non-creedal, but these, these creeds are very important for the development of what we agree on is what is Christianity or what is, uh, what, who is God, what is the Trinity. These things are all things that will develop out of these creeds. Very important for us as, as, as Christians today. Even how we read the scriptures are, even though we are, 
we are influenced by these creeds. Because our mindset, remember that when we talked about Old Testament, that encyclopedia? Even if you are non-creedal, your encyclopedia has some of this knowledge in it, and it looks at the scriptures through some of this, this, this point of view. Very important um, in our understanding uh, how we develop as the universal church. Um, well, some creeds are better than other creeds. Um, so constantly our universal creeds are, are, are made by representatives of the whole, as the whole church emerges and they, out of theological controversies. Um, we see some of the biggest creeds come out between the year 313 and 451. These are when some of the biggest creeds, and I, I bet you know some of them, We'll get to some of the big ones. Uh, actually, we're going to cover one of the biggest ones right now. Um, the earliest type of creed was the baptismal creed. And it was found in the baptismal creed of Jerusalem. And this one, I couldn't find um, the earliest dating on this because it was so old that it was just part of the Jerusalem church. It has no start date. <laughs> Um, and I believe in the Father and in the Son and the Holy Ghost and in one baptism, p- baptism of repentance. That was what they would rep- repeat at baptism in Jerusalem. And that was the earliest creed I could find. Now, if someone's out there online and knows the one earlier, I'd love it if you shot me an email. I, I'm not a church history expert, but... Um, but that was the earliest one I could find. Now, um, in Irenaeus and Tertullian, they developed rules of faith to be used by Christians to defend against the Gnostics. And so we'll see those be a summary of the major theological doctrines. And that's one of the reasons why, uh, you know, Irenaeus and Tertullian, even though Tertullian kind of goes off deep into, at the end of his works, it's so important because he kind of lays down what people were believing at the time. Irenaeus, I mean, if you haven't read Irenaeus and like a hard, meaty read, there you go. Uh, it's, it's early work. It's good. It was taken from the scriptures, yes. But it, um, but it was something that they would, but it's not a scripture voice. It's not like they're repenting, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're not doing that out of scriptures. This is the creed in one baptism. It's a statement of faith. Because that's what creeds uh, are. They're often just taken straight from the scriptures. Or at least their interpretation of the scriptures. And we'll talk about that now as we talk about the, uh, the Apostle Creed. Um, this is really becomes the, one of the oldest summary of the essential doctrines of Scripture that we have. Uh, not written by the apostles, but it's, um, you know, it, it's taken from some of their teachings. Um, we know it was used in Rome before 340, so we don't know exactly when it started being used, but we know it was before th- 340. So within the 200 years of the Old Testament being written, not formalized yet as the Old, I mean, sorry, the New Testament being written, not formalized as the New Testament, but the books were already written. And 340, at, in between that time period, this creed has developed and being used as a baptism formula in the earliest times. Um, it appears... Um, in some of the writings we, we have from the 400s and in the 300s as well. Um, the creed, um, which is one of the most important works we have on our understanding of where the idea of the Trinity comes from. Because remember, the tri- Trinity is not in the scriptures, like in the sense of the word Trinity. Um, how do people, are how are people understanding the Trinity? The Apostles' Creed. Now, when I start going through the Apostles' Creed, I bet some of you are going to be like, I know that one. Uh, many churches today still use this as a 
convenient summary of points in the Christian faith. So it's still very readily used. Um, but I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of the heavens and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born or Spirit, born of Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, and crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascends into heaven and seateth on the right hand of God, the Father the Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the repent- resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Um, I point out right here on this one, the Catholic Church, notice it is lowercase. Lowercase C means that it is the word universal. I am the universal church. Um, the most controversial line in this one is line eight. He ascended. Uh, he see where is it? There he is. He descended into hell. The most controversial line in the whole. Uh, of the whole thing, um, many, um, many elect to just omit this line uh, because it is so controversial. Well, let's find out. Is it? Is it, let's let's talk about that. Is this scriptural? What do you guys think? Look it up in the Bible. Come on, pull out your Bibles. Look it up on your phone. Let's find out. Pull out your Bibles. Get on your phones. Where is it at? What's their backing? If you're online with us, do the same. Pull it out. These are good questions to ask. What's that one say? <laughs> all right, all right. Let's... Let us, all right, I'm going to look up that passage here. Uh, I go, don't just read, read an article on it. Go to the passage and see what it actually says. <laughs> I wish I had. is not coming up with my Bible is not coming up on here. That 
What's the question mark mean in your Bible? Oh, you mean like it has a question mark, like as a question, like did it happen? And it's in parentheses, which usually means it's not in the earliest translations. Um. My son, can I have my phone? This one's, my, this, my, my tablet's running a little slow today. As in it just crashed, so. All right. Um, I'm going to turn the, the most, uh, my my tablet just crashed. Hold on. Las Vegas. <laughs> That's funny. That made me laugh. Um. Well, I'm going to have to look up Ephesians 4.9. I don't know that one off the top of my head. Sorry. No, my phone's working. That one says, He descended into lower parts of the earth. Um, the biggest verse that actually deals with this subject is Peter 3.19. Yep, 1 Peter 3.19. Yep. This is the largest place where they, they talk about uh, in there. There's other parts of the city to the lower parts of the earth, but a lot of it depends on what you believe about what, well, 319 reads, in which he also made proclamation to the spirit in prisons who were disobedient in the past. He was put to vest, made alive, in which he went and made proclamation to the spirits in prison. The truth is, is how we view hell and the word Hades determines whether he went to hell. As we think of that traditional, like he went to the burning place of, of torment. Or if he went to Sheol. Mm, there's a big word in the Old Testament. 
Sheol is a word in the Old Testament that means simply the abode of the dead, the grave. And there are two sides of Sheol. There's Abraham's bosom, the good side. And then there's the bad side. But it's not hell as we think of that, that term, hell. Um, the idea of hell as we think of doesn't develop till later uh, than the Old Testament days. Even the New Testament, it hadn't fully developed yet. And that place of eternal torment and stuff like that, Gehenna is the word used there. Uh, the word in lower parts of the earth and... Uh, and there, a lot of it's referring back to Sheol, which would have been the grave. He went to the grave. And how do we ter- interpret that? Did he go to hell? And a lot of that is determined by your upbringing and how you believe the scriptures to be read. Away from the presence of God. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, it's described in a couple different ways, as um, mostly as as Gehenna, uh, the destruct, uh, uh, you know, fiery place, torture. Um, but the idea that um, that idea does not develop later. Personally, I'm going to throw this out as a personal, I'm not going to force you to believe it kind of thing. I'm not creedal. Personally, I don't believe he went to hell. Because I believe every time it mentions him going to lower parts, it's referring to Hades, which would have been the grave, or Sheol, not our idea of hell as it's been developed. Um, In prison, yeah. Yeah. But it doesn't seem that he went to what we know or are divine as that suffering place of torment no one gets out of kind of thing like that. That does not seem to be where he goes, according to my understanding of the scriptures. Yes. Sheol is the grave. All dead go to the grave. There's Abraham's bosom side. It's, um, and then there's, but there's Abraham's bosom side, and then there's the, uh, I guess more people would be common with Tyrus side. The, <laughs> uh, um, anyways, uh, the good side and the bad side, but it's not, it's not seen as like heaven and hell. It's one place, two different kind of areas for you. Kind of. Um, and, and so my understanding of the scriptures, and so I'm not going to I'm not going to force you to believe what I believe. I go study it for yourselves. But the idea of hell, I think, is a bad translation. Uh, a lot of the, especially the King James, is really bad about this. They tra- every time they see the word Hades, they translate it as hell. Um, and I think it should be translated as Hades. Um, Yeah, I'm not going to go there. I can't go there. Um, no, I just can't go there. He went to the grave. Um, well, it says he preached to the dead there. Um, and he took with him, he apparently went to paradise that night, that day, because he took the... He, he, uh, he took the uh, well. He, he it says he, yeah. He broke the keys. He, he it's like uh, he, he. Hades, uh, Sheol is where death is, right? And he broke the keys of death, giving us eternal life. Um, so that's what that key kind of means. It's like bro- breaking the chains, releasing us from the bondage, the, unlocking the gate of of, of death. Setting the captive free. There you go. Well, that's where that key comes from. Uh, yes. Um, death wears your, your victory. 
I just heard a good song about that. It was by Kurt Vernon. And it has uh, Death Wears Your Victory. It was on, it's on Amazon. I heard it on there. Uh, Kurt Vernon. Yeah. Um, it, was a good, it was a good song. Yeah. No, he was like, well, yeah, I do that too. But this was a, I listened to this one because he was a, a guy I knew, uh, went to school with. And so I listened to his, his work. And, and so he's, he's a singer songwriter. And he's, it was a good song. Yeah, it was on Amazon. Spotify and everywhere else, I guess. Um, so anyways, so did Jesus descend in hell? As you can see, already in this room, we've had arguments as to it. That's why a lot of people um, omit this one from the Apostles' Creed when they put it in because it is one of those verses that there is not a, uh, a, a consensus on. But at this time, there was that he descended in hell. And like I said, I, I personally think it's a bad translation of the word Hades, but, um, but it is very controversial. All right. Well, I promised I'd let you guys go early so that you could vote if you did not vote. So I'm going to pray us out of here. And we, we didn't get as far as we wanted to. I wanted it to. But we'll talk about the New Testament canon. Starting, We'll start with the New Testament canon next week. So... Father God, I praise you today, Lord. I thank you for uh, uh, just letting us be here, Lord. We pray for whoever is voted in yes. today uh, that um, that they may uh, see beyond the the greed and the the party lines and, and do what's best for the people of this nation. That we may uh, seek your face, Lord. We pray that you will. Um, be with those who are voting, those who are out in the rain right now. And we pray that uh, you will just continue to bless us and keep us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.